Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. Most people, although they are fascinated by the prospect, simply do not believe in the supernatural. They consider that witches and vampires, demons, and all the other myriad spirits of the netherworld have gone out of style, that they no longer exist except as figments of the diseased mind. Maybe. Although they would never admit to practicing black magic, there are witches' covens all over the world, even in our own America. I take no stand in the matter. I leave you with this story to decide for yourself. Don't talk about it if you don't want to, Jenny, but what happened? We were driving back to the hospital after she... after Sharon died, and he was like a wild man. He was driving too fast? He was burning rubber like it had gone out of style. But why? Maybe he... He wanted to commit suicide. No, not my brother. And not with you in the car. But such a terrible accident. How did you get out of it alive? It... It wasn't my time yet. Our mystery drama, Child of Misfortune, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The home is a pleasant one on the outskirts of a small town. Not large or too expensive, but with a feeling of being well lived in. By the farthest stretch of imagination, no one could even accept the idea of any ghost haunting this bright little villa, or any skeletons skulking in closets. It's a house that suggests nothing but life, and its occupants, Dr. Sam Taylor, his wife Jane, and their son Bucky, just beginning his 13th year, are just the sort of people you would expect to find living in it. Except for one thing, Dr. Taylor is a general practitioner, but his specialized interest is in pathology. The surgical dissection of the dead. Uh, Sam, that you? Sure, honey. Now take it easy. Go back to sleep. I'll be right with you. No, I wasn't asleep. I'm always so scared when you're out these days. Scared? Oh, come on. I don't have that many late nights. Well, even one a week is more than enough for me. I'm sorry, darling. My life. You got to live it too. Remember? For better, for worse, etc. Oh, I don't really mind it, Sam. Except for... Except for what? Oh, forget it. Just what my mother used to call night qualms, I guess. Well, I'm a city girl who doesn't adapt too well to the country. <laughs> this is scarcely the country. And what's to be afraid of? I don't know. Squeaks, squeals, rustlings. I'm just being alone, I suppose. I mean, there's so much crime, and... That's the second time you've hung up on saying something. You better say it, honey. Get it out of your thoughts. It's about me, huh? Oh, so silly. I just wish... That I hadn't taken the job as medical examiner. Yes. But it's my field, Jane. Cutting up dead bodies? Oh, well, that's what I get paid for, so I deliver. But there are secondary benefits. What? Do we have to talk about it tonight? It's only in understanding the causes of death that we can make any attempt to keep it from happening. Oh, come on. Not at three in the morning. What a crazy discussion with a woman I love. I'm sorry, darling. I'm a mope. Well, I work too hard at more than one job. You know, we owe ourselves some time off. Mm. Like Tim. He lives it up all the way with Sharon. 
<laughs> Why didn't I decide to be an actor like my older brother? I don't know. Why didn't you? Because uh, I wanted permanency, continuity, endurance. Mm. <laughs> I hope I bought it. You know, I had this crazy feeling hovering over me all the time that, that it was all an illusion that... I wonder... The police? That's too soon for any results from tonight, unless we've got another DOA. Oh, damn phone, I'd love not to answer it. Well, then, just, just take it off the hook and forget it. I wish my bump of whatever it is, morality, conformity, was just a little smaller. No, I have to, Jane. Hello. Yes, yes, this is Dr. Sam Taylor. Who? Yes, of course. It's about my brother's wife. Oh? Is she... Well, well it's impossible... Well, have you any idea what caused it? Oh, that's incredible. Uh, look, doctor, I'd like to discuss it with you further, but first let me talk to my brother a moment. What? Dead? My darling, not Jim, too. How? Huh? Uh, yes. Yes, I see. Uh, well, well, for the moment, I, 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 I don't quite know what to say. Yeah, of course I'll be there to make arrangements for the funeral. Uh, excuse me, funerals? Oh. I can't believe it. What about the girl, the, the, the daughter? Yes, of course, I see. Well, well look, just, just hold everything and I'll, I'll be out there by tomorrow night. Yes, I should make it before dinner. Yes, that's fine, and, and thank you. What is it, Sam? It, it, it's crazy, Jane, it's just crazy. Sharon had the mumps and, and, and suddenly she's dead, and so is Jim. Well, how, how could both of them... I can't explain about his wife. One of these things medically which shouldn't happen this day and age, but does. But Jim is something else again. Wait, no, you're not making any sense. Sharon died from mumps? Or complications. And Jim? Oh, no complications there. He was driving to the hospital and went off the road into the canyon. Killed? Yes, burned to a crisp and the car oh. caught on fire. It's an absolute miracle that Jenny escaped. Their daughter was with him? Yes. Well, how badly is she hurt? Well, according to Dr. Holcomb, whom I talked to, she was thrown clear and came out unscathed. Look, Jane, I've got to go out there first thing tomorrow. Well, of course you do. You want to go along? Well, you know I do. But, well, what about Bucky? I could call Mom and Dad. Well, no, 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 don't forget it. Jim and I were never very close. You know, I never even met his wife. I'll fly out there and handle it. There's only one thing. What, dear? Jenny. I don't know if she has anywhere else to go. You might end up having a daughter, more or less, in the house. I can't leave the child alone. Of course you can't. You know she's welcome here, darling. Oh, your, your poor brother and his new wife. What a terrible tragedy. From the Los Angeles airport, I went straight to the hospital, since there was no answer at my brother's home in Beverly Hills. The physician in charge, a Dr. Holcomb, met me. How do you do, Dr. Taylor? Sorry to meet you under such tragic circumstances. Uh, we're doctors, and particularly in my case, should be inured to the fact of death. Only sometimes it never quite happens that way, does it? No matter if it's in the immediate family or not. Well, I'd hope that most of us are still human beings. What happened to my sister-in-law, first of all? I don't know. But, well, she had mumps, right? Dr. Taylor... She had glandular swellings. The whole lymph system was invaded by something. But what it was, I haven't the faintest idea. But the cause of death? Massive edema. Lungs, heart failure. Hmm. What did the autopsy show? Nothing. Nothing? I'm a toxicologist myself. We had a neurosurgeon. Oh, it isn't her. Sharon wasn't my real mother anyway. She died when I was born. Then my father married her, Sharon. And then when he died, your brother came along. Way after she was brought to the hospital, shortly before her death. So? Well, since we have no epidemic here, as you can realize, diagnosis is often difficult. Yes, of course. The symptoms, especially in an adult, could be... Well, could be anything. But tests, even post-mortem, must have shown something. Nothing, Dr. Taylor. And believe me, they were done exhaustively. All of us here are just as puzzled as you must be. I've already told you how your sister-in-law died, almost literally smothered or choked to death as if by some evil force. But why? What caused it? Well, our records are all open to you for study. I'm sure I couldn't find out any more than all the distinguished men who've already tried. But let's leave that for the moment. My... my brother... Uh, 
I can be more specific about that. When I uh, notified him of his wife's death, he... Uh, oh, well, quite frankly, his reaction was almost... Uh, what shall I say? Paranoid. Paranoid? Yes. He screamed something on the phone about... Well, again, he was so distraught, I thought the, the word was witch. But, of course, it could have been a more familiar one. Witch? In what connection did he use it? Well, I can't exactly say. It was something about... Uh, so the witch has had her way. And then he slammed up the telephone. I tried to call him back, but the next contact I had with him, with your brother, was when they brought him or his remains to the hospital. After the accident? Yes. And we can only presume that he was on his way over from the valley on Benedict Canyon. And somehow lost control and went through the guardrail. The car was totaled. And your brother... Oh, you, you don't have to go through that. I know that he was caught in the car and it, uh, that it burned to a crisp with him. But what happened? He, he couldn't have tried to kill himself. Well, it's one reason I was called in. There are some who thought he might, under the circumstances, not have been quite himself. Oh, sure. What was the alcohol in the blood? Normal. No other evidence of any drug. Under ordinary circumstances, I might have guessed at a suicide attempt, except for... Except for the fact that he had Jenny in the car with him. Mm. So that rules that out. We use our comfortable little phrase, death by misadventure, right, Doctor? Right. Which completes the role of the dead. Now the living. I called the house as soon as I landed, but there was no answer. Do you know where my niece is? <laughs> I most certainly do. Although she was... Uh, and I must say that there's only one word for it. Miraculously unharmed. I was afraid of post-factum shock. I, I kept her here in the hospital. Since she seemed to have no one else to care for her, except yourself. Hmm. How is she? Well, I, uh, I can only say that from any point of view, she's a most remarkable and <laughs> completely beguiling young woman. Young woman? But she's only 16. Yeah, so I've been informed. It's hard to believe. Her self-possession and, uh, what shall I say, uh, inner strength are quite formidable. Only matched by her general appeal. <laughs> she's very hard to resist. I might mention also that she's quite incredibly beautiful. Hmm. Uh, may I see her now? Yes, yes, of course. She's been waiting anxiously to meet her only surviving relative. <laughs> I followed Dr. Holcomb. I was conscious of a strange aura of mystery hanging over my brother and his wife's death. Somehow, both seemed so unnatural. Oh, I don't for the moment mean that I had any precognition of the fact that there was anything supernatural about them, or the niece I was about to meet. But I did have an uneasy premonition of... Well, I don't know exactly what. And at any rate, it was banished momentarily the moment I met my niece. For I must say she was the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. A woman. A 16-year-old child. Looking at her, listening to her, falling under her spell, she was as lovely and compelling as any of the great beauties of all the ages. Well, Jenny, how do we feel today? Oh, so much better, Doctor. Thank you. I brought you a visitor. Uh, no, something more than that. <laughs> a relative. Yes, well, I'm, I'm your father's brother, Jenny. Uncle Sam! <laughs> no, that sounds funny, doesn't it? No, well, maybe, but I don't mind the comparison. Jenny, I, I'm sorry about everything. Are you all right? I guess. Only, what's going to happen to me now? Why, you're coming to live with me and my wife, uh, if you want to. I think that would be super. Aren't you going to give me a kiss to let me know I'm welcome, Uncle Sam? <laughs> I'd be glad to do that little thing. Mmm, that was nice. And I think I'll just leave out the uncle. All right with you, Sam? Should I have known right then? How could I possibly have guessed the dark violet eyes, pools of strange and infinite wisdom, the voice, half child, half woman, in that ravishing body, all woman, or most of all, the kiss, 
far less a welcome than an invitation to and promise of forbidden things to come. I should have taken to my heels and run as though the hounds of hell were at them. But I didn't know. I didn't guess. And so I sealed my doom. Intriguing? What doom? What threat can a 16-year-old girl pose to a doctor in his late 30s, no matter how precocious she may seem? Precocious? <laughs> no, that is not exactly the word for Jenny, as I think you will agree when I return to continue this story shortly with Act Two. Where were we? Oh, yes, precocious. An adjective usually applied to a child... Meaning, of course, exceptionally early development. The ripening of something or someone before its time. Well, that would apply to Jenny, naturally. But it would be only part of the story. The tiniest part. For the rest lies submerged in dark layers of history that are timeless and beyond boundaries few would dare or know how to cross. But which we will cross as we dig for the rest of this fascinating story. Flying home in the plane with Jenny a few days later after the funerals, looking sideways as she peered out in eager fascination at the ground far below like any other young girl. I was ashamed of myself for other thoughts that had clouded my head. Oh, look, look, is that Las Vegas? Yeah, that's it. Old Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I don't think it could be that wicked. I'd love to be able to go there and gamble. Well, the percentages would all go with the house. You can't win. Oh, the luck couldn't run against me. I'd win. What's that mean? Just that I always do. When I want to. <laughs> well, I'm afraid it'll be a couple of years yet till you can prove that out. You mean because I'm not of age? That's right. I don't think that's fair. Well, lots of things in life don't seem fair, Jenny. Yes. It could have worked out if only... Oh, you poor kid. Try not to think about your mother. Oh, it isn't her. Sharon wasn't my real mother anyway. She died when I was born. Then my father married her, Sharon. And then when he died, your brother came along. When I got home... Hello, Sam. I thought you'd never get home. What are you doing up? Waiting for you. You look beat. Sit down on the couch, kick off your shoes, and let me get you a drink. No, I don't think I want a drink, Jenny. You won't join me? Well, who said that you could have one? Me. Alone. He was like a wild man. I asked him to let me drive, but he wouldn't. He was driving too fast. He was burning rubber like it had gone out of style. But why? I don't know. He was real gone on her, Sharon. Maybe he wanted to commit suicide. Oh, no. No matter how frantic he was with grief, Jim would never do that. I know my older brother too well. And certainly not with you in the car. No, it was just a terrible accident. But how did you get out of it like you did? It wasn't my time yet. Hmm. You sound like a combat soldier. You know, you are quite a fatalist, young lady. If you want to call it that, old man. <laughs> Only you're not old at all. So like Jim... Only younger. I'm really going to dig living with you, Sam. And Jane. Jane. Who's my wife? Oh, yes, your wife. I wonder how she's going to feel about me. Like footsteps over my grave. A faraway icy draft in a back layer of the mind. Why? The statement was innocent enough. But it was only the way she said it. As if... As if Jenny had already made up her mind how she felt about someone she'd never met. Jane! Jane, we're here. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I didn't hear the car. Hmm. I missed you every minute, though. Oh, Jane, darling. Uh, this is Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hello, Mrs. Aunt Jane. <laughs> That's nice, dear. You, you know, I, I hope you'll be one of the family. I hope I can. Where's the other member? Oh, Bucky was all in a dither. He was dying to meet his new uh, cousin. Or oh, sisters, I hope you'll beat Jenny. But uh, Peter Timmons' father had tickets for some big league baseball game, so he took them up to Kansas City for lunch first. And they're not back yet. He hoped you wouldn't mind, Jenny. Why should I? How old is Bucky? He's 13. Gee, I 
never would have thought you were that old, Aunt Jane. She doesn't look it, does she, Sam? Well, I don't think she looks old at all. Well, anyway, she's not like Sharon, all painted up and hair dyed and all. It's nice to see someone not afraid to look her age. Oh. Well, I guess I should take that as a compliment. Uh, come on, Jenny, I'll take you upstairs and show you your room. I carried up the bags and then went downstairs to make myself a drink. It was a little early in the day for one, but... Of course, Jenny hadn't meant anything by her remarks. Or had she? Yeah, I could tell that Jane was a bit miffed, which isn't like her. And damn it, she had made me glance at the wife I loved and noticed that she had a few strands of gray hair. And the wrinkles were beginning to show. But with unpacking, Bucky's arrival home full of the game, and the excitement at meeting Jenny, dinner, and one thing or another... It wasn't until we were in bed that Jane and I had any chance to talk privately. I'm surprised about Sharon not being Jenny's mother. Yeah, it's a mixed-up history. The whole marriage was a mix-up, you know. Imagine not being at your own brother's wedding and never even having a chance to meet his wife. My other brother, Ted, was fit to be tied about it, too. Well, you were laid up with pneumonia. But the police department could have let Ted go. Oh, no way. He was on subpoena to the court as a witness on that murder case. And you know my oldest brother. Even if he could have gotten out of it, duty always comes first. Mm -hmm. Ooh, older brother. There are only two of us left now. Oh, my poor Sam. It's easier on me. I have you. Ted has nobody. Thanks to me. No, we're not going to rake up that ancient history. Well, I did steal you away from him. Nothing of the kind. I made the choice. Now, come on. That's enough agonizing for tonight. You need some sleep. Uh, look, dear, if it's asking too much of you to bring Jenny into the house... Oh, don't be silly. I'm sure she'll be a help. And Bucky's crazy about her already, and... And? Uh, nothing. She's a strange girl, though. My Lord, how beautiful a little sex goddess can you be at 16? She really put me in the shade, didn't she? You mean... <laughs> You remark about not minding showing your age. Well, yes, if you want to know. Do I? Well, not to me. I do to myself. I looked in the mirror, damn her. Well, she couldn't have meant anything. Of course not. It was just an innocent remark. Except... What, dear? I have... I don't know. I have the queerest feeling that for some reason she... She's antagonistic to me. Now, that is downright ridiculous. Everyone loves you. I don't know about that. What reason in the world could Jenny have for disliking you? None in the world that I know of. Well, then, look, let's just call this all off, baby, and get some sleep. Hmm? Good night. But it wasn't a good night. There weren't to be that many good nights left, although I didn't know that yet. And all through my half-waking, half-sleeping state, I was haunted in my dreams by violet eyes promising ancient wisdom and tight young flesh. And then it was morning, and something like the old familiar life began all over again, and the days went wheeling by. I don't mean to complain, dear. Well, what is it? Jenny again? Well, I have to spend most of the days with her. You are out. Mm -hmm. Working. Of course. So what is it that she's done? Well... Nothing, really. Just little things that somehow... I, I don't know. They rattle me. Oh, Lord, I'm tired. So, all right, for example. Well, I know it's going to seem silly, but she's forever after me to cut my hair or give me a manicure. Well, what's wrong with that? She just wants to do something nice. All right. Do the washing. Clean up after dinner. Anything. But wh wh why does it have to be so personal? Well, did ever think she might be trying to sort of heal the breach between you? There isn't any breach. We've just never gotten together. And another thing, several times I found her in my room, prowling around my dresser. And she says she's looking for a nail file or a powder or some ordinary thing. Well, for Pete's sake, what else? You think she's trying to steal? No. Well, then what? Please, Sam, don't let's quarrel. It, it's happening more and more. Oh, I, I know, I know. I'll have a talk with her, okay? I, I was thinking of taking Bucky up to see my parents this weekend... But what I'd rather have us do is just get away together. There isn't a chance, dear. I'm tied down on a couple of cases. Well, why don't you two go, and that'll give me a chance to set up some ground rules with Jenny. Well, all right, dear. But can you manage alone? I think I'll... Well, we'll make out. Jane, 
Are you all right? I mean, physically. Well, I think so. I'm just I'm very tired. Why? Well, let me feel your neck. Why? Hmm. Grand area is a little swollen. There's a puffiness under the eyes that I... Oh, please. I feel quite old and unattractive enough as it is. A couple of good nights sleep in the mountain air and I'll be fine. And maybe you can get Jenny straightened away. Now, I'm, I'm sure this is best and it will all work out. Famous last words. Best. But I suppose, in a sense, it was the real beginning of the eventual solution. The first night that Jane was gone, I had worked late. And I hadn't the slightest notion of working anything out. Except that when I got home... Hello, Sam. I thought you'd never get home. What are you doing up? Waiting for you. You look beat. Sit down on the couch, kick off your shoes, and let me get you a drink. No, I don't think I want a drink, Jenny. You won't join me? Well, who said that you could have one? Me. Alone. I hope I'm right in believing you. (laughs) What difference will that make? No one else will. I'm an instrument of destruction. But I little expect it to be destroyed myself. At least you are destroyed with me. Oh, no, you little witch. You can't have it all your way, youngster. We'll just forget this. You had a drink and you don't know what you're saying or suggesting. Oh, but I do. And I'm not suggesting. And don't tell me you're not buying. I can't believe that I hear what you're saying to me. Oh, you better believe. You're under my spell now. There's no escape. Just as there was none for your brother. Except the road he took. Why, you little witch, I ought to just... (laughs) Saved by the bell. Don't count on it. Go ahead, pick it up, Sam. Pick it up. And after you listen, you tell me who holds the whip hand. Pick it up. Dr. Taylor here. Oh, Jane, darling, I I didn't expect you... What? Yes. But what are your symptoms? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But how on... What about Bucky? I see no signs, huh? Yes, well, 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 look. We'll take no chances. Uh, can Bucky stay on with your mother and father? Good, that's fine. Then you go straight to the hospital from there, and I'll be over to join you. Okay. No, no, no. There's no no question it sounds like mumps, but we'll know as soon as we can run some tests. I'll see you at the hospital, darling. Bye. <laughs> Isn't she a little old for mumps, Dr. Sam? You be quiet. Oh, no, you're the one who's going to be quiet. And listen to me. What? Sharon had mumps, too, remember? And she died. Because I wanted her to. You. You are a little witch, aren't you? And this time, I don't want any mistakes. I'm going to get just what I want. Jenny revealed at last? Or is she? Is this just a girl shocked by a succession of tragedies in her life who has lost contact with reality? Or is it Dr. Sam Taylor whose preoccupation with the dead and whose story we're listening to who is the man who breeds fantasies? I will return shortly with Act Three. A vibrant, beautiful 16-year-old, sensual beyond her years, who may be the epitome of all evil. The girl who may be a psychiatrically distressed child or a witch. And drawn to her, fighting desperately against her enchantments, a relatively young doctor who, by his own admission, fights to escape her physical allure and who himself is overwrought, overtired, and racked by several emotional shocks. What are you trying to say, Jenny? What is it you want? It's very simple, Sam. You. Oh, stop talking like a silly child. But I'm not silly. Not at all. Nor am I a child. I want you. And what I want, I take. Oh, look, I'm afraid that Jane would take a rather dim view of that. Jane doesn't matter. She's out of this. What? Oh, come on now, Sam. You're the one who's being childish. You really think your wife has the mumps? What else could it be? A hex, my charming lover. A fetish doll stabbed and stabbed again. The poison drips into its veins until it swells beneath the skin of the unwanted. 
As the cursed one feels the thorns and spears pierce it to the soul, where it writhes in agony, knowing the body will die, and it will be lost, lost to scream down through all the night years, hung between heaven and hell, never to find a home. How do you think Sharon died? I wanted Jim for my lover, but she stole him from me, so I made her image. And I made her dead. You're mad, Jenny. You're sick. How can a child dream such fantasies? No child. No fantasies. Come. I'll prove it to you. As if hypnotized, I followed Jenny upstairs to her room, my conscious mind operating as a doctor. At one level, I was accepting the fact that somehow the trauma of this girl's past had ended in paranoia. And I was thinking how best to handle her. But underneath, writhing like some tethered snake in the morass of sense memory and superstition and fear of the unknown, was a voice warning me what I had known from the beginning. I was trapped in something beyond my comprehension or control. And then, in her bedroom, Jenny wrenched open the door to her closet and pushed aside her clothes to reveal... Draped over her suitcase, stood upon end a black cloth. On it, between two guttering votive candles, lay a doll. A figure with long, real red hair and tiny fingernails on the modeled hands crossed over its breast. An effigy of Jane. With revulsion, I remembered her laughing about Jenny's wanting to trim her hair, give her a manicure, skulking in her bedroom. But most of all, what made my blood run literally cold was the sight of the two shiny, silver-bright skewers driven down through the doll's neck on both sides, pinning into the mock catafalque and the rest of the slender stilettos which waited, neatly laid out, ready for some future foulness. I wanted to be physically sick. Now do you believe... You really think that you killed your mother? My foster mother, not my real mother. My real mother made me all I am. She was me, and I am her. In one body, inseparable. As I will be with my child. Which you must give me. Jenny. Jenny, what am I going to say to you? Nothing. I will talk and you will listen. It could have been your brother. But he wouldn't. But there was this difference. He believed. He saw me drive the last sacrificial knife home and knew that at that same moment Sharon died. And he turned from me to seek revenge instead. <laughs> he thought he could kill me. Jenny, what is it that you want? I've told you. You. But why me? Because you are in your brother's image. And because I need a girl child be there to carry on my human guise when I am called home. You're mad. And even though I don't know if I am absolutely sane, I just don't know how to talk to you. No need. Just promise me to give me my girl child. If you want to save your wife. And if I don't? The next pin shall pierce her heart like Sharon. After that, I take your son if necessary. You have no choice. The weapons are all mine. I don't think so. A gun? As medical examiner, I have a license to carry it. And it is loaded. There's nothing you can do about it. You try to stick the pin in your hand into the doll, and you might be surprised at my reaction. Oh, then I'll test it. <gasps> oh. I didn't believe you. I hope I'm right in believing you. <laughs> What difference will that make? No one else will. I'm an instrument of destruction. But I little expected to be destroyed myself. At least you are destroyed with me. Oh, no, you little witch. You can't have it all your way. Not after knowing you. 
I can never be the same again. And heaven alone knows where I belong. It was relatively easy. It was so simple for me when extracting the bullet to exchange it for any one of the slugs in the morgue file of unsolved murders. Who's going to look further? So it seemed as if I had committed the perfect crime. I had gotten away with murder. But I hadn't gotten away with murder. As long as one person knows, dead or alive, you have failed. And it wasn't just one person. It was sheer irony, sheer ironic coincidence that the homicide detective called in was my brother, Ted. Well, whatever was the matter with Jane, looks like she's out of the woods, huh? Yeah, Ted, the, the infection's gone, just a matter of recuperation. Oh, what is it, Ted? You're my brother. The only one I have left. I'm a cop, and my profession, myself, me, my honor, whatever you want to call it, is something that can't be invaded. It's all I've got in my life to give it meaning. You're an honest man, Ted. Everyone knows that. You knocked her off, Sam. And I can guess why. You mean Jenny? Yeah. How did you know? The bullets you switched. Why'd you have to pick one of my cases, and Feldman in particular? It's funny the way life is. I just found his gun after all these years, too late to use against him because he just died. But no bullet from that gun could have been fired to kill Jenny. So then I checked. And the bullet I found in the files came from, well, guess whose gun? Mine. Yeah. With a wife like Jane, how could you have done it, Sam? How could that little tramp be worth it? And what am I going to do now? So I told my brother Ted about it from the very beginning. I think you've gone right off the track. You ought to see a psychiatrist, maybe a lawyer. What do you mean, a lawyer? Well, right at the moment, it's less that you're my brother and that you happen to be married to a woman I love and have a kid who deserves every decent break he ought to get that's holding me and my conscience back. Every cop instinct I have tells me to go looking for a warrant for your arrest. Now, Ted, wait. Don't do that to Jane and Bucky. It wasn't me did it. It was you. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. It's something i got to think out. How would I have solved that problem? But don't ask me, because Jane handed me a far bigger one when she came home from the hospital. Yes? Your husband, can I come in? Why not? Or the door seems to be locked. I'm sorry, I forgot. It's never been locked before in all our marriage. I, I never felt quite this way before in all our marriage. Like how? Like I don't know you, Sam. After two weeks in the hospital that kept us apart? No. Since Jenny came into this house and was alone with you while I was gone and died. You think that I killed her? I don't know. I think she killed our love. What did you do, Sam? Get her pregnant. We could have worked that out, maybe. Well, why don't you answer? Jane, do you honestly think that I could have... Oh, don't lie. Please don't lie. If there were any rational explanation why a child that age... Can you give me any? I don't know, Jane. I don't see how I could. I, I don't think I could tell anyone anything that they would believe. Well, where are you going? Uh, uh, just for a drive. Think, maybe find some way out of this. I put the top down and drove over by the old quarry, wrenching the convertible around the turns until the tires screeched. The wind rushed by me. The wind that I hoped would clear my head. But instead it brought a ghost voice whispering in my ears. Where are you going, Sam? I don't know. No place left for me to go. In your world, maybe. How about mine? I don't belong there. You no longer belong in your own. You're lost. Just as lost as I am. Leave me alone.
said in the beginning, few people really and truly believe in the supernatural. Certainly Jane and Ted would never have accepted any such world. To them, Sam's unfortunate accident was fortunate. For Jane, it closed a chapter in her life in terrible sadness. And for Ted, it was, in a sense, a relief, since it solved a problem that lay on his conscience. And in the long run, it was the beginning of his real life. For eventually, he and Jane married. I'll be back shortly. Once again, looking back, we have threaded our way through the maze that winds back and forth across the border of real life and shadow life. And as always, it seems, we end with not answers, but questions. Are there truly creatures beyond our ken? Or is everything just in the mind? To tell the basic truth, there's nothing either good or bad. It's thinking makes it so. Our cast included Norman Rose, Jada Rowland, Joan Copeland, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Enjoy this episode of CBS Radio.